Transportation Advisory Board, May 8, 2023, 6 p.m. Uh, call to order. Do a roll call. Taylor Wicklin. Here. David McInerney. Here. Steve Lehner. Here. Diane Chris. Okay, we'll move on to approving the minutes of the preceding meeting of April 10th. Do any board members have any comments or corrections to that? Uh, two comments. <clears throat> Page one, number three. The December meeting was held on the 12th, not the 9th. And that occurs in two places. And on page nine, second to the last paragraph, should read in part, revised crash report status. Crash being the added word. That's it for me. Page six, uh, number six, we were talking about reviewing the bylaws, and it was mentioned that I, they were reviewed last April, and that I suggested we should review them again, but I actually think we're good. We just need to all have this, the newest documents. So I don't know that I said that exactly. Those are the <coughs> changes to the minutes from the uh, April 10th meeting. We can move on to communications from staff. Great, good evening, uh, board members. Bill, Would you? Yes. May I interrupt, please? Um, we need a motion to. I need a motion to approve the minutes once they've been amended. I move to approve minutes as amended. Seconded. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Now we'll move on to communications from staff. Yes, thank you, Stacy. Appreciate it. <laughs> um, I'm Phil Greenwald, Transportation Planning Manager with the city. Um, I want to introduce Jim Ingstead to talk a little bit about the Vision Zero update that we presented to City Council on April 25th. So I'll turn it over to Jim for that report. Good evening, board members, chairman. Um, just uh, want to give you a, an update on where we're at with Vision Zero. Um, as you're aware that on April 25th, 2023, Council adopted Vision Zero via resolution. Uh, so we are moving forward. Uh, the next step is the formation of a task force. It's currently underway. Um, we're currently identifying stakeholders and preparing for an advertisement to, uh, um, for inviting some of the residents uh, who may want to um, volunteer to be on the task force, uh, anticipating maybe seeing 20 to 30 members on that whole task force of our stakeholders as well as, as um, the, uh, some of the residents. What we would also uh, throw out at today's, today's meeting is how does uh, the advisory board want to be represented? Um, I think in the past uh, some of the members have indicated that, uh, an interest in being on the board on the, this task force. Um, we would anticipate that you would have a, a strong, uh, strong force in that, so I'm not sure if you want to decide tonight or put it to uh, um, a uh, uh, give it a month to the next meeting and then make a decision then. So um, just something to think about. And at the end of the item, we can, we can discuss it further. Um, we're also working on, on currently on our staffing needs for Vision Zero. Um, we've undertaken an, an evaluation of our existing staffing or existing FTEs that are currently in the Public Works Department. Um, we have a, a currently an unfilled position uh, that we're no longer, we, we did a reorg a few months ago, we no longer need uh, a body in that position, so we are um, looking 
to uh, shift that over to a, um, a Vision Zero manager or coordinator to start taking the lead on this program. Um, we're currently working with the, uh, human resources uh, to determine the details of that position. Um, what is the job description going to look like? What is the pay rate going to be? Um, and then we'll process what is called an ad change form to change that position over. It is funded through other, other funds, the water and the sewer fund. It would have to be all shifted over to the street fund. Um, that is underway now. Um, we're also evaluating the staffing needs citywide. Um, for implementation of Vision Zero as part of the 2024 budgeting process. So that will, will be an ongoing endeavor. Um, and then we're also starting an RFP uh, request for proposals uh, for consulting services to assist with um, the uh, documentation and basically crafting of the action plan. Um, and the other items, we're also evaluating budget needs for Vision Zero for not only this year, where are we going to initiate some dollars or find some dollars to fund the, the, the beginning of the action plan, um, as well as budgeting for 2024. Um, so uh, what we'd be looking for is we'll, we've already um, proposed several, a number of dollars, about 400000 in next year's CIP to initiate Vision Zero for some projects. We'll also be putting money into our operating budget, which is uh, where we fund a lot of our signal improvements, some of the small-scale signing and striping. So those budget, those items will be be ongoing or budgeted as part of for 2024. Um, one of the uh, other items, um, which came up from the from actually even after the council meeting, we are will be applying for a Safe Streets and Roads for All grant to assist us with funding the action plan, and that's where we're at to date. So I'll throw out, do you want to make a decision about who wants to be in the <laughs> task force, or do you want to think about it and wait for another month? We can open up for comments. Uh, a, well, I, I would volunteer, but I think it would be appropriate, depending on when the task force comes to be, to maybe wait for other members uh, to really actually get a maybe a more diverse, also uh, expanded outlook, so. Jim, how many task forces do you think you'll have? You have like one for each ward, or, uh, you know, are you thinking one for each neighborhood? I'm thinking one for the whole city. This is the task force for creation, creating the action plan. The action plan will detail how we kind of take on Vision Zero. There may be future task forces for individual areas of the city. That could be part of the action plan. Um, we'll just have to see how we, we decide to craft it. So you're thinking 20 participants in one big group? Is that what you're... I, I was visualizing a task force very similar to the, to the recent climate emergency task force, which had, I think, 20 to 30 members. I, I don't want to limit it. I don't want to say, you know, some offers up to, to be engaged with, with some of this. I don't want to say no. Um, we just have to see what, when we put out an advertisement for, for volunteers, what, we, what, what comes out of it. Okay, that's fair enough. Um, I, I agree with uh, Board Member Wickland that um, maybe we should get through the interviews and have a few more board members appointed and see, see who has, has time and interest. If we wait a month, would we lose our chance to put someone on the task force? Absolutely not. Okay, then I agree uh, that there is a wisdom in waiting at least a month. Yeah, I would echo that. Um, I, I would think for the representation for our board, we probably don't want more than, I'm thinking, two, possibly max three. Uh, I wouldn't want to take away seats from other stakeholders where we're already involved in it, obviously tangently from sitting on the board itself. So that's just my thoughts on that. Will the task force meetings be public meetings? open to the public? 
Yeah, I didn't anticipate this to be a, um, an open public forum kind of thing for, um, you know, open to the public to, to sit in and listen. Yes. Great. Uh, Mr. Angstad, I have one other question, and, and that is, do you have um, do you have a source of information you could provide to TAB that explains in greater detail the elements of Vision Zero and what the task force would be expected to accomplish? I, yeah, certainly we can put something together um, from previous presentations, and, and we're, we're kind of pre preparing an outline of what we would envision an action plan to look like. Um, or, you know, with, with, with components of it based on what we're seeing in, in, in other communities as well as the Vision Zero Network. Um, certainly, I can look on something for next meeting. Okay, great. Yeah, the next item from staff is the Central Elementary School traffic update that was requested at the last meeting. So, again, I'll turn it over to Jim Engstead for more information on that. Thank you, Phil. Um, so, Central Elementary is um, school in um, kind of west central uh, part of the city, west of Main Street. Um, it is surrounded by four streets, um, 4th uh, Avenue, 5th Avenue, in the, the south and the north, and then in the east by Bross, and in the west by Gay Street. Um, there's been a lot of talk about, about the area. Uh, I've heard you know, from a number of the neighbors saying that the um, signing and uh, school zones are uh, inadequate or outdated. Um, staff's done a number of, of reviews of the area and just wanted to let TAB know that the signing and striping in the area is in accordance with our standards uh, for the city. Um, but that doesn't mean we can't uh, add a few more things. We, we've, we met with the residents um, back in, uh, several residents back in August uh, before the last school year or just as the school year started. Um, and we, we, we talked about some adjustments to some of the striping, some of the signing in the area. Uh, what we, we then took on with our operations team was we adjusted um, and added some crosswalk striping at 4th and Gay, 4th and Bross and 5th and Gay. Uh, we also restriped the mid-block crossing. It was on the 400 block of Gay Street. Um, we added crosswalk signing in at 4th and Bross to accentuate that crosswalk. Um, we also identified in our field meeting the, the, a number of the stop signs at all of these intersections were placed beyond the crosswalks so that someone, a vehicle stopping would be stopping right in the middle of the, or in the front end of the crosswalk blocking pedestrians. So we have our operations team shift all of those stop signs to be basically in front of the crosswalk so that a vehicle will stop uh, before the crosswalk. Um, we then also um, we talked about adjusting some of the, the school zone signing where the flashers are. We did adjust one of those and extend one of those uh, school zone areas. Um, we also did propose the extension of the school zone on 5th. Uh, that has not yet been accomplished yet. That requires uh, shifting of the, one of the flashers and we have uh, our, our uh, traffic signal team has been um, working towards that, but it still has not been accomplished. We'll hope to have it done before the start of the next school year. In addition to that, we've also been collecting uh, pedestrian data and speed data. At, um, we did it initially at 4th and Bross. Um, we got a request for four-way stops at that intersection, so we analyzed, used that data, analyzed that intersection um, for the establishment of a four-way uh, crossing stop signage. Um, that was done in September of 2022. It did not meet the criteria according to the MUTCD and the Uniform Traffic Control Devices. So um, that intersection remains as is. Um, we also evaluated the accident history at those intersections. We've heard that there's a significant number of accidents there. So we went back about five years and looked, and at four of those, in, on all four of those intersections, there was a total of five accidents. Um, over a, over a five-year span. What's, it's interesting to note of those five crashes, four of them involved people disregarding stop signs. Um, we also evaluated, uh, it, there's a lot of pedestrians because it is a school, so we get a, you know, an influx of, of, of school, of kids, you know, like twice, twice a day, um, both arriving and departing. 
Um, we looked at the, the pedestrian and bike accident history at those four intersections, and we went back 20 years. Um, and then 4th and Bross was the only intersection that had a pedestrian-related crash um, of all those four intersections in 20 years. So part of the challenge with, with looking at this area is what, what are, when we hear about residents, about accidents, we hear about them, about safety, we're trying to figure out what problem we're trying to solve. Um, so we are currently collecting data again in this area. Uh, we will be um, on all four of the roadways. We will be evaluating, reevaluating all four of the intersections to see if it warrants stop signs. Uh, we anticipate that work to be done within the next two weeks. Um, we committed to that to the city manager, so we will be providing that um, within, I think, a week from this Friday. Um, we'll also be working with the uh, school district. We're going to be scheduling a meeting with them to work over the summer to see what are the issues that they are seeing and then addressing them prior to the start of school. Um, and then over the summer, we will, our operations staff will be restriping all of those crosswalks so anticipating for school to start to make sure that they are, are highly visible. Um, we are also looking at an additional school zone on Bross um, to see if that uh, warrants to be established, um, and that may, may address some of the residents' concerns. Um, the speeds on 4th, 5th, and Bross are 25 miles per hour now. Um, the speed school zone on one lower it's a 20 in accordance to state statutes. Uh, Gay Street is posted in, and is uh, 30 miles per hour. And that was the update I have for that area. Any comments from the board on the central elementary school discussion? Uh, yeah, thanks, Jim. Uh, just a question on the next study in the next couple weeks. Because school gets out soon, uh, so because you know, I I I went there, drove there on fourth. You know I couldn't cross gay for at least five minutes because there was hundred kids um, getting out of school. So so I'm just curious if the study will include also maybe during the you know maybe as a flashing light saying 20 miles an hour um, on gay, but then also realize there's a hundred kids trying to get home. So, so I'm just trying to figure out how we do this study and at what time of day. So we, when we look at the, the, the counts, we do them basically, I think we do them over three days. So we look at the data over that, those, all three of those days for 24 hours for each day. So we count the data, we pull in all that data and, and then look at the warrants, what is necessary for the warrants. Uh, and I'm a traffic guy, so I'd have to defer to Kyle exactly what those warrants are. Um, I know one is, is uh, depending on the amount of vehicles per day, one is regarding pedestrians, I'm not sure what the other ones might be. Um, but they do, do look at a, kind of a number of items uh, as part of that analysis. Yeah, so we're currently collecting data right now. Um, we're almost complete with that. and uh, we, School does end in three weeks. Uh, but most of the changes we want to make during uh, any part of the school is during the summer. Um, usually when you make changes throughout the school year, uh, people are very used to the routines, so it's very hard to get them to notice the changes. Um, so middle school year is not a very good time, especially when it comes to um, kind of safety in general. Uh, so we'll make those improvements then. Uh, but the data we're collecting is kind of a multi-approach um, where we have the traditional roadway tubes um, that you see on the roads. Um, we've also invested in a couple of radar units, so they're off the road. You do not see them in the road at all, um, and they collect uh, speed data. And then we also had uh, video collection of the intersections to see uh, for pedestrian counts, bicycle counts, and also um, some incident um, reporting to see if there's any close calls and like that. So our uh, engineering tech's going through that data right now to get into a presentable format. And then uh, just, just a uh, just a broad question. The the NUTCD, you know, I, like I, I always, you know, when 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 I talk to engineers, they always refer to that that document, and you know, and and you know, I read the N NACTO uh, more so, and 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 they kind of butt heads a little bit. So so I'm just wondering how many guidelines do we need to follow versus maybe what's just the right thing to do. So our current 
uh, standards is to use METCD. Um, it's kind of a federally accepted standard uh, for traffic engineering for signing striping. Uh, when you do deviate from that code, it does incur more risk to the city you know, using non-standard approaches. So even some NACTO stuff uh, follows METCD, but um, doesn't necessarily go with it. So in an event something about something that may or may not help or um, may cause an issue, um, the city takes more risk on that part versus being able to defer to MCD and then show that that's a standard practice in the engineering field. So it's more of a legal... Yes. Yeah, as far, as far as that, there, there's, there's options, but um, as far as the city standards and city code is, we use the MTCG in the Colorado uh, model traffic code. Okay. Uh, thank you. Yep. So I'll just add, add to that. I think one of the opportunities of Vision Zero would be to, to take a look at, at some of those standards that have been utilized in the past, and there may be opportunities to adopt others. Um, as, as Kyle indicated, it's embedded in our code through an adoption of the, the model traffic code, the state statute. So that's what we follow. So we would have to, uh, there, are, there are ways around that with basically we've, we've adopted parts of the model traffic code. So part of, I think, Vision Zero and the Action Plan would be to take a look at that and, and it may be requiring some code revisions. But I think the opportunity is that will be there. And uh, just for other board members, because board member Chris was asking, uh, NA, uh, NACTO is uh, National Association of City Traffic Officials, or City Transportation Officials. So, great website. Thank you, Jim. So one, one last item from staff, if there are no more questions. Um, we just have the board recruitment process update. You'll see four members up, up there, <laughs> four active members, and we'd like to get back up to seven eventually. Uh, two of you have volunteered. Thank you very much, uh, board member Chris and board member Lehner, for, for volunteering of the times. I think Stacy has put together some a number of times for us to choose from. We have four people that applied to the Transportation Advisory Board for the next uh, group of folks. One of them is under 18 years old, so not eligible. So we have three members that are really eligible eligible members. It's great to see the excitement of a younger person who wants to get involved in transportation. So I, I wish we had different rules, but we don't. <laughs> so we'll, um, we'll interview three different folks uh, uh, when we put this together later in May. So appreciate your time on that. If you have any questions, let me know. But we're just, just to give everybody some information, we're on our way to doing those interviews, then we'll get them to council in June, and then council will be able to uh, check our recommendations. We'll, we can make recommendations or we don't. You know, we can choose. So uh, there's a lot of flexibility, I think, on our part as far as uh, what we provide to council. But we should try to make a, a recommendation if we can and, and make sure uh, we, we feel good about the, the folks that we're sending out. So just wanted to let you know where we were in the process. So if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer. Bill, is it possible to, to leave application process open to where we might have five applicants? Unfortunately, the application process is pretty strict as far as the time, the deadline. So we passed our deadline. That opens it up then to this next step in the process. I wish we could do that as well, but uh, we'll have to see how many people we get on board and see if we need to do this again at the end of the year. Hopefully we do not, because we really are a mid-year board. And that's, we, all of our things are run to June 30th. All of our terms run to June 30th of the year. So we have two regular member terms ending June 30th, 2026, so we'll have to pick two of the three for that. And there's one unexpired regular member term ending June 30th, 2025, just based on how we had resignations over the past and, what, and who, who left when. So that's what we'll have to do is figure out. That'll be probably the biggest part of our recommendation to City Council is who should get the longer terms and who should get the shorter term, or well, we don't have to fill all those spaces either, so 
Oh, or we don't have to recommend it, but all the spaces mm -hmm. be filled. So. Is, did I understand you to say that at the end of the year we could have another open application for mid-year? I'm checking into that because we're doing that on the airport advisory board, which I also am part of. So um, we are doing that. We're doing mid-year replacements on that board because we've had a number of resignations too and people moving away. So uh, I don't see the difference my, in my mind. So if, if we don't have a full board, let's see if that's possible. Okay. Thanks. At our previous meeting, um, a gentleman named Garrison from Sunrise Drive spoke during the public invited to be heard portion of the meeting, and he expressed an interest in uh, becoming a TAB member. Is he one of the three candidates? I can't say, but <laughs> we do. Uh, well, it, if you can't say, I guess my question is, would, if he's not, would it be appropriate to reach out to him and remind him that if he was not one of our candidates, we could not reach out to him? Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Phil. That's it from staff. Thank you very much. Okay, now we will um, do comments from our public input. And it looks like we have um, Don and Ruth Clays here to speak. Come right up here. Hi. Thank you for letting me speak with you tonight. My name is Ruth Clays. My husband and I are residents of Firestone, Colorado. However, we come in to Longmont every single day. Um, the reason I'm here tonight is to question you about the feasibility of having, extending a bike path from on along Colorado 19 up to um, Sandstone Ranch. We are avid bikers, and we would just, it would be so nice if I could actually bike in to work in the morning or to my doctor and then back home and feel safe. 119 is just so horrendous, especially in the morning, if you've ever traveled on that, and the same way at night. And I don't know what the feasibility is of connecting those two areas um, would be, and perhaps I need to talk to Frederick Firestone as well and figure out what their plan is, if it is part of the plan. So that's what I'm bringing to you tonight, and I'm hoping that you may consider that for in the future. Questions for me? Am I done now? No, thank you. <laughs> thank you for the comments. If you have anything else you can add, but um, we, we can definitely look into that or, or ask. Um, and you're probably right, it would involve probably a multi-jurisdictional kind of conversation. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Phil. I don't know if you want to save it to the end. Um, we've got quite a bit from RTD, so I'm just wondering, I can really quickly address that, or I could talk to her back behind. Back. Um, great. Um, so we are working with Firestone, Mead, Bolt County um, to try to extend a path that goes from Union, from Union Reservoir, which will be a connection to Sandstone Ranch very soon. We're working on that connection to go east over to the St. Frain uh, State Park okay. so, and connect with those trail systems. So we are working with the folks. We have some transportation improvement planning dollars or program dollars, tip dollars from um, the region, Denver Regional Council of Governments, to start designing and got some construction dollars, too, to get, to get at least one phase going. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we can move on to the RTD presentation, because I know that's probably the bulk of our time tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Just a real quick introduction. Um, so we work with these folks very closely. These are the staff members from the Regional Transportation District. They're not elected members. We did invite the elected board members uh, to this meeting 
a little bit later in the process than I would have liked, so I apologize for that. One person was in Spain, so we did we do have one of our board members in Spain, so she did not want to partake even virtually on this one. But um, the other, I did not hear back from the other board member, but I apologize for not letting him know sooner. But I just did want to make it very clear that this is not, well, these are not policy folks. These are staff members just like us. Um, so just appreciate your, we told them how uh, kind and gentle you guys are as far as a, a board. And, and so we just wanted to pass that along. Thank you very much. And here's uh, Natalie Hanlos to kind of kick things off from the RTD side. Thank you. Good evening, tab members and uh, councilwoman. My name is Natalie Hanlos. I'm a senior service planner scheduler for RTD service development division. I'm here to give an update with several of my colleagues on the local regional service special services and long-range planning projects that we have ongoing right now. Let me introduce the team real quick. Let's go through here. We have Greg Filkin, who is our service planner scheduler one. We have Chris Quinn, who is our um, planning project manager. We have Ali Emansipani, who is a project manager for engineering. And we have Patrick Stanley, who is our manager for um, engineering programs. So we're going to tag team it. And to keep it moving, just real quick, do we have the uh, overview? We have quite a few topics to cover per request. We are going to give you an update on the fixed route services. A uh, quick update on our special services. Our project, or, or our manager of special services, unfortunately, could not be here tonight. So if there are any follow-up questions, we'll be happy to take those questions back and get you the answers and information that you might need. We're also going to go quickly over the future plant services, as well as give you an update on Northwest Rail and the Longman Station. And then to close it off, I'm going to give you a quick update on CO-119 BRT. I think everybody is familiar with that project as well. Okay, great. Off we go. Well, Greg gets to go first. Six uh, update. There you go. Good evening. Uh, Greg Filkin, RTD, and it's a pleasure to meet with all of you. And I'm going to go over our basic um, fixed route service for Longmont. And so what we're doing is we're comparing last year's August run board to pre-pandemic run board. And basically what our costs, this is what our costs were here, uh, August 22, um, versus August 19th, and you can tell in August 19th we spent $2,915,200. Um, this last year it was $1,815,687,000 was our total cost here in Longmont for the local services. And this breaks down each of the local routes, the Bolt, um, as you can see like the J has been suspended. Um, the LX has been suspended. Um, we are, and you can also compare our, our total service hours um, and our frequency that we're running, um, comparing the, the two. Um, any questions as I'm going through on these? If you see anything that stands out, please, you know, feel free to, to ask. Um, and this is our statistics going daily boardings, average daily boardings, going back to 2016. And you can see that it really takes a hit um, when that pandemic in, in, in 2020. And we are not back um, to where we were uh, three years ago. And, and uh, so this is our numbers here. Uh, I know that... Um, like the bolt, for example, the, the, between here and um, Boulder, I mean, it's, it's almost, you know, not even, it's a little more than half of what we were running on our daily boardings. The locals are seem to be coming back a little better, um, but still half of what we were boarding pre-pandemic. Um, and this is our local boardings. Um, it just in total for the area up here, um, year by year, um, by route. And this is just the, the local, what we call the 300 routes, 
323, 324, 326, and 327. And you can see there where we're, we're not back to where um, we would like to be. Re here again, the regional boarding is 2016 to 2022. Um, and you can see as we're going, you know, we're, we're, we're doing okay. We're holding pretty steady. And then we had an 81% drop in 2020 understandable. And, you know, 2021, we got back, you know, 64% increase over 2020, and we're back up, you know, 24% year over year, 2022 to 2021. Special services. Uh, this would be your flex ride. And um, in the way it's broke down is how many in-service hours we have for the flex ride. And uh, so as you can see here, we're running, again, uh, post-pandemic. We haven't recovered the number of service hours that we were running uh, pre-pandemic. Uh, and we're running about, for 2022, about uh, 4,400 hours a year. Um, and so there again, it's just... Uh, Ridership will dictate when things come back. Mr. And here's Kelvin, our, oh. uh, do you have any data or have you done any studies as to why you haven't returned to full ridership after COVID? You know, we're, and, and I'm really, you know, <laughs> there's a lot of theories. You know, I mean, if, if you look at everything as a whole, a lot of our commuter traffic, is not. So people that are commuting from Longmont to Denver that would have rode the LX or would have rode the LD are not commuting to Denver. Um, a lot of, of people are remote work. Like, things changed. You know, people learned how to maybe not go to the store as much. Maybe they're ordering. You know, I mean, there's a lot of different reasons why it hasn't come back um, and does this this is the million dollar question is yeah. what it is. Does it correlate with um, remote worker data from unemployment? On our, I, I don't, I'm not sure because no. you know that that's out of my area of expertise comparing those two numbers yeah. um, but I can tell you like oh, see, see okay. here, here's the expert on this. <laughs> I'm going to let the more experienced team member here take over. That's Here's right. your clicker. That's right. That's right. No problem. So it actually, it's a national trend that we're watching, and it's not even an international trend, that anywhere for transit, ridership has not come back to a point that it was before COVID. We're seeing ridership at about 75% return from pre-COVID which is actually pretty good. There are a lot of areas that are only seeing 50% at the most. There are some areas where ridership has come back more than that, but there are far and few in between. And that is mainly because travel patterns and demand has changed. That's due to the remote work uh, policies for very many places that, for instance, downtown Denver has maybe two at most three days per week, people coming into office and then they don't necessarily go into office full day. They have shift work. They are also, because of the way routes are currently operating, because we had to suspend certain routes, people are not riding as much because the services are not available. So it's a little bit of a chicken and an egg thing. <laughs> Yet there are only so many resources that we have. We have to point out that we do have a driver shortage or a people power problem, challenge. I don't like to say problem. It's, it's an opportunity, but we have very short operators, and that makes it very hard for us to bring back all of the services that we would like to bring back, yet we also have to be very conscious of taxpayers' money. So we cannot just put all services back and hope that ridership comes back. We have to look and see where ridership is, where the demand is, and make the adjustments based on that. We have certain areas within the Denver metro area where ridership has come back quite well, as I said. Um, Aurora is one of those areas where we actually have routes where we need to add service. 
is we have standing votes and we have pass ups at certain times a day. We have other routes that are very busy with the service level that we're providing, yet the challenge is we cannot increase those service levels because we don't have the operators to do so. For Longmont, it's been pretty steady. We're actually happy to see the numbers that we have, especially for the local routes. The bolts, that's a challenge because it is mainly a commuter route. There are some students. Students are back in class, and you can see that uptick occurring for the bolts when students start to come back to CU. That is that additional ridership mainly. Um, for the flex rides, people, yes, travel patterns also have changed. Like Greg said, there are people now, they've figured out you can order certain things online. You don't have to make all those trips. They're coordinating better in regard to medical appointments and so forth. Where with Free White Long Launch, that was back in 2015, 14. <laughs> Time flies. <laughs> we did see an immense uptick in ridership when that program came into place. And people decided to take the bus more often. It wasn't that necessarily more people were riding, but those who were riding were using the, the service more often, which is great. That's what it's there for. However, with the pandemic and now coming out of pandemic, again, the need has changed, and so we have not seen that uptick yet. Also, in regard to schools, we have not quite seen the demand from the schools back that we used to have. Where before we were struggling to meet that demand, we don't necessarily have that struggle, which is a good thing on one hand, because we don't have to turn too many passengers down. <laughs> but at the same time, it means, yes, the ridership is lower. Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Oh. And I think Greg, was, that pretty much finished it for, for special services, and I'm up next anyway. Right? One more question. <laughs> uh, yeah, just one question related to COVID, because now we're trying to figure things out after. Um, and then obviously we're, we're learning people's patterns are changing, but then uh, could you say a, a, anything of what RTD has learned as well of, of how either how do we increase that ridership to provide service to especially the people who really, really need the service? Well, um, it appears that we are providing the service that is needed, especially when it comes to the local routes. Those were the routes that pre-COVID were the ones that had ridership that was transit dependent. I don't necessarily like to use that term either, but that's a standard industry term. That the majority of, of people who were using local service were transit dependent. They had no other choice, and that's what they were using. And that has been the same for decades. I've been the senior service planner for the Morse team for 14 years. <laughs> it's time flies. And I, I, I've been in the area for over 20. I've been doing this for over 20 years, close to 25 years now. So looking at that, the, the trends haven't changed based on you know, who rides what. You have those who ride the regional service, and you have those who ride the local service. And there's hardly any overlap that people actually transfer from regional to local or local to regional. It's Drive to the parking rides, you get on the regional bus to get to Boulder or to Denver, hmm. or you use the local service to get around, you use the flex ride to get around. Uh, I, so, I, I guess what, what I'm kind of alluding to is, as you know, uh, what one good example here in Longmont is we do have local buses, but like this board, if we wanted to take a bus home, the last one is at 8 when we leave. Right. So, yeah. so, so, that, so thinking of the the service industry workers that are getting off at 11, 12. So, so like that, that type of thinking of what are we learning from COVID and maybe the people who really need transit. The demand-wise, it's yeah. actually been, we extended the service. It used to only run until like 5.30, late at 6 o'clock. And we were able to extend it a couple years ago until 7 plus because there was some demand. We did hear that. Yet when you look at who is riding, how many people are riding on average on those trips, it's in single digits. And so for us to extend that service any later would not be using taxpayers' money very well. So we are aware of that. What would make, make sense instead of fixed route is to look at the flex route and see is that a service that we would want to extend the service hours of because that would actually allow you for more flexibility to get anywhere within Longmont, right? 
just versus having to be on a fixed route that then you can only get to specific spa places, specific times. We've had conversations. <laughs> Back in 2012, I think we took several of the school triple routes and merged them into, mer took those in-service hours and merged them into the flex ride in order to provide more service on flex ride because that is where the demand is within Long Lawn. When you were look at a, a map that shows two from origin destination trips within Longmont, it, it's everywhere. People try to go from everywhere to everywhere all day long. And so fixed route can only do so much, and there is a demand for fixed route, yet there is a greater demand for flex ride. Now, even though ridership is in back, I think some of that has to do with the restrictions in the vehicles that are currently out there. The, the service that we can provide with the resources that we have. Would we look at potentially some of the other routes, some other way to increase service hours for FlexRide, figure out where can those resources come from in order to address that and allow for more flexibility. That's definitely something that we've talked about multiple times. It's definitely something that's always up on the table as an option. It's, it's one thing to put the lines on the map and say you have fixed route service, right? This is where your taxpayers' dollars go. But when they can't really provide the service that your community needs, then we should take a look at that and see what can we do to make it better. And, uh, that's all for now. Okay. Great. Moving on to the next topic. So future plan service adjustments. There, this is specific to... Colorado 119 BRT. There also is, and you might have heard about the Reimagine RTD, the system optimization plan that was approved by the RTD board last July, July 2022. So there are two pieces to it. I've only included the 119 part, but I can definitely give some information related to the system optimization plan as well. So for the 119 BRT, we worked with staff and with a consultant very closely to make sure that this local trans transit network feeder plan for Longmont was incorporated as part of the Highway 119 project so that when the 119 BRT project comes online, and currently we're looking at 2026, that we could then have the opportunity to restructure the local network based on connections, improving connections to the 119 BRT, which currently the bolt and the, you know, the J suspended, but the bolt operates, yet there are going to be some changes. There are going to be some ma major locations that are stations versus just stops. And so the network plan was created to allow for those better overall network connections. <laughs> not sure how well you can see this on the map. You have the current network and uh, on the left hand side and on the right hand side is that local proposed feeder network. You can see the underlying gray lines where current service is versus the colored lines to where the proposed new routings are. Again, those routings were based on every input from city staff, based on where at that time in 2018-2019 there were centers destination centers, origin destination centers, as well as these proposed future stations for the 119 BRT. Yeah, and these, are, these are lines on the map. The plan is attached to the 119 BRT. If this doesn't make sense when the BRT comes online, we will have a conversation, say what is it that is going to make sense? Because it makes no, it, 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 you know, again, if I put lines on the map and it doesn't serve the community, then I'm not doing my job. However, on this map, the, the one thing that I do like is we were able to push this through <laughs> was uh, the 328, which would go over to Walmart and the hospital, which we know there is demand there. Of, and, and Costco now, that's right, Costco. <laughs> that, yet it hasn't been enough for us to establish that fixed route. The, the demand is in low single, single digits, one, two, ever so often people asking, even the flex right, one or two people ever so often 
it, it's not that high demand. However, in the future, never say never. That's why the line is there, and that's why we want to make sure that we have that opportunity, should it allow for itself, that we can, we can make it happen. Also, just real quick, so you get an idea what that, it would be a service increase to have that new network. And these are the numbers, it's a table, you can look at it, I'm not going to go over every single number, but just know that it would be an increase in service if we were to move this forward. Now, when 119 comes online, again, we will take a look and say, what's going to make sense, what's warranted. We do have server standards that we have to follow, so we can't just silly willy put out service just because it's in a plant somewhere. We have to see what the resources are that we have at hand. And again, over the next couple of years, we're going to be closely watching what the travel patterns are, where the demands are, and then through our regular service changes, which we do three times a year, January, May, and August or September usually, we'll address that and put the service into place that's going to make sense. Uh, and there's a question about this map. Um, a, I'm, I'm glad because, you know, just had a conversation with Phil about, you know, Iron Horse apartments aren't serviced. Um, and I have some friends over there that can't get into town. Um, and then also there's a hospital over there. Um, I think getting into the details is kind of pointless right now, but I, but I am curious if we could learn how this process goes about, how long this process takes. So like you, you say once the BRT goes online, uh, there might be adjustments. How long does it take to adjust? Um, because... Um, you know, time, time is of an essence if you want people to use the bus. So. No, great question. Usually, if we're working on regular service changes, from one service changes to the other, we're working six plus months ahead. That's just regular service changes. So if we're working on something that is a big project like this, we're already having these conversations. This is, this is already on our radar that we need to make sure as we progress with 119, and we're looking to potentially make some adjustments even to the BRT patterns because of travel pattern changes, that we keep a very close eye on what the travel patterns and the needs are within the community. So implementation-wise, it would happen with the service change that implements the BRT, the 119 BRT in 26. However, the planning process is already ongoing. We're already meeting with stakeholders with eight local agencies. We've had some public meetings as we move forward and get into 2024, later 2024, and into 2025. That's when we're really going to do some specific outreach in the corridor in Longmont and Boulder with the public specific to get that information. We've already done several surveys. We're going to continue to do some more surveys to get that information, and we will then look to put that plan together. My team has to have it done six to nine months ahead of when the implementation happens. So if we say 2026, middle 2025, fall 2025, I have to have something that says this is what we're going to look to go with. Because we have to know what our resources are, etc. As well as publicize it. Does that answer your question? Um, yeah, mainly. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll it, it is very complicated. <laughs> For a regular service change, we have a spreadsheet that is an 11 by 17, size 8 font. For each service change, it is 7 to 8 pages long. The, those are all the details that we have to follow each service change. So it's, that was the big picture, 30,000 <laughs> Okay. Move right along. Oh, hey, um, uh, Ms. Um, Hutton was... I know this on the new plan that... Can we go back? Um, yeah, if you don't mind. That, you're reducing service on the northeast side. And, but when I look at, I'm talking about the 323, which is the green line on the, the left map. And uh, we have a lot of, if you look at the very top hook there, um, the 323 ends at Santa Fe. Whereas if it went to the end of that block all the way to Alpine, it would actually intersect with all the high-density housing and senior housing that we have there. It's a little far for them to get to that 323. And I notice on the um, change in service that you've only lost about 200 riders. 
but on the 324, you've lost about 400 riders since COVID. So I, I'm concerned about centralizing service more when there's a lot of activity and a lot of building on the east side. And honestly, up in that area, um, the poverty level is at, you know, 48 percent, and uh, per persons of color are over 50 percent in that neighborhood. So I would think it's an underserved area and should get more bus service. Right. So as, as I mentioned, as we're going forward, these are just lines on the map. We have to have a plan to attach to the 119 BRT plan so that as we're moving forward, we could have the ability to make these changes to make this network adjustment. So how so long are we going to be without service on the northeast side? But at this point, the ridership and the demand, and we can have that conversation, right? This, this is where I rely on city staff to tell me. Mm -hmm. They would know much better than I would as to what exactly is going on. We keep an eye on what the development is and so forth. But for an area like that, we should have that conversation, and we should look to see if we can make that change earlier than waiting to implement the plan. It's well, definitely something that could be done. I guess to be more specific, I think if you made the change to go all the way down, all the way west on Olympia and turning around on Alpine, you get a lot more ridership there because it would intersect a lot of housing. The, 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 you know, for me, I live up in that neighborhood. It takes me a mile to ride my bike to catch that, but that's my, my favorite route to catch. And every time I pass those units, I think, well, I don't think the seniors are going to be able to make this bus because they're not going to get on a bike and they're not going to walk that far. And then, you know, there's all the um, regular apartment complexes there, too. And I just think it would be easier if it came down all the way Olympia and turned around on Alpine. It just makes more sense to me. Yeah, as city staff, we can, we can certainly look at that and take those into into consideration when we're talking about the actual details, when they come out with the actual route changes, which, again, Natalie said, said probably won't be exactly what you see on this map. A lot of things have changed land use-wise since we worked on this two years ago, three years three ago. Years so more than that. Yeah. It was 2018. Oh, gosh. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm getting old. We've rebuilt three more buildings <laughs> since then, okay? Yeah. yeah, we were originally pushing just for the, you know, for, for some of the things that we saw out there in 2018. So. We knew the things that were going to change. We just wanted to kind of get the idea that there'd be more service. So I would look at the service numbers more than I'd look at the actual lines on the map and just understand that we're going to get more hours of service uh, and more uh, variety of bus uh, routes than we have today. And so those are the things we can we can we can play with the with the nuances, the details. Uh, we'll, we'll make sure those are right. There may not be overlap on some of these things where we see overlap on these maps. Uh, who knows? But the details will be worked out as we get closer to the idea of implementation. And then they go through a whole public process where they come back out to the cities that are, uh, are affected by the, the route changes or the new service and work with actual uh, our community to figure out what kind of comments. If somebody says, hey, this, this might better serve uh, this, this location if you were just to move the bus a, a block this way or a block that way, then they, they do listen to that and they take it into consideration. We also have to go through Title VI. Our civil rights group evaluates every service change that we do. So as we move forward, any of these changes, they would look at that, and that's one of those things that they probably will point out to us and say, hey, you know, you have an area over here. You need to address this. Yeah. So. And then I have one other quick question, and that is, it's, it's new for Longmont, but do you factor Vision Zero into your, your formula? Yes, we will have to because it will slow down the buses. It makes a big difference. You might think a minute here or there it doesn't, but it adds up quite a few. So I was actually thinking that during the staff presentation, I was going to talk to Phil and say, so <laughs> where are you all planning this? And then we also have to keep an eye out, depending on what the mitigation is for the speeds, if there are speed humps or narrowing of the roads, mm -hmm. it affects our operations. We might not be able to get a bus down the street all of a sudden. It has happened before. So, so just a, a thought is it uh, might make more sense to have a wider pattern, in other words, to go around the areas rather than to be more centralized because of Vision Zero. But, you know, just cogitate on that. It's just an input. Yeah, we're, at this point we have 8th and Kaufman as our main hub. We are going to have Longmont Station soon, also mm -hmm. as a main hub. 
we're going to be looking at Main Street as a spine, so to say, as we're looking to also have another park and ride on the north end at Highway 66 and 287. So looking at these different locations to spread out that service and not necessarily have everything at all three hubs, for sure. But Longhorn Station in the plans is the hub to allow for local and regional transfers and to allow for that future rail connection so that we have it all in place. But as it comes to the other locations, we're going to be looking at spreading it out a bit more to allow for that wider net. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. Oh, for, for this one, I just wanted to point out real quick that we did include the, the frequencies of the service, which it wasn't in the other two slides. I just want to make sure that you had that so you can see when it was 30 minutes versus 60 minutes. It's not necessarily the same frequency all day. And when we say 30, 60, then 30 is in the AM and PM, and 60 is midday. If you want more details on that, I can happily provide that, but at, but at this point, just, just the basic facts. Okay. Right. Fair study updates. Chris, thank you. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> uh, I'm Chris Quinn, and I am one of the project managers on the FAIR study that RTD has been conducting. I've got a lot of slides. I'll try to go just in the, for the manner of, what's the word? In the interest of time, I'll try to go through them fairly quickly. So please, if there is additional information on any one of these slides that you want me to focus on, happy to do that. But um, I'll try to buzz through them quickly so not to get too into the details. Going into the study, we had three main, we did three goals. Overarching goal was equity, make sure especially, and I know, you know, Natalie just mentioned the fact that especially since the pandemic, one of the big ridership changes we've seen is a lot more of our riders are people um, that, and like Natalie, I don't really like the word transit dependent, but people who have no other choice but to ride transit. Um, so we wanted to make sure that now that that's really become a big chunk of our core ridership group that we made sure that anything that we come up with is um, supports those customers. Also, over time we've heard, and um, I'm sure you guys have probably heard when you're out in public, our TD fares are too expensive and that they are complicated. So our goals, equity, simplicity, affordability. Real quick here, we, we started the public outreach portion of the study back in roughly April of, April of last year had three major, uh, what we were calling, engagement milestones. We went out to the public first in April with kind of, okay, what, what do you think of the f current system, even though we sort of knew the answer? People hate it, and they think it's too expensive and confusing, but that's exactly what we heard. Uh, in the summer, we came out with some real high-level concepts of, okay, you know, what, with these concepts, what would you like to see? Then in the fall, um, we came up with uh, two alternatives, which we have since uh, merged into one alternative based on uh, public feedback. And I will jump right into what that is now. Currently, our fares, uh, you see in the, the red box on the left side of the slide. And then the proposed fares are on the right side in blue. A couple of big things to take note of. One is that the regional fare has been eliminated. So we would, with, with the exception, of the, we still have an airport fare, but for all other fares, whether you're hopping on the L bus going to Denver or you're uh, heading somewhere around town, cost is the same, and it would be lower than the current local fare, which is $3. So that the standard, what we're now calling the standard fare, that would go down to 275. The other big thing to take note of is currently the monthly pass for a local is $114 a month. If you get one for the regional, again, so for the, like the L services or the airport, and those two are combined, it's $200. That would be reduced to $88. So pretty significant savings on the monthly pass with the intent of trying to reward our you know, frequent flyers, so to speak. And then for the discount, adult discount fares, then the discount fares are applied to anybody who's uh, 65 and over or somebody with disabilities. 
uh, the fares in general, they're half, but just a couple of things here to note. For the monthly, we went way down. So monthly pass, $27. And for the discounted fares, uh, one other big thing, um, no local or uh, no local regional or airport. So if you're subject to a discount fare, you can travel anywhere in the district for the three-hour pass for a dollar thirty-five, day pass two seventy, and again the monthly pass uh, twenty-seven dollars for the month. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with what we're calling we call our Live program. That's the our, it's a program for people uh, low income. It's a specific pass for them that they can apply for through the Colorado Peak System. That's the state's uh, benefit system. Uh, one of the things, when we were out in the public, especially as we were talking to uh, nonprofits and to social service agencies, one of the things we found is, well, it's a great discount. There are still a lot of people in need that don't, uh, just don't quite qualify for it, but are still in need. So we'd like to, right now, a couple of things. The discount that a live customer gets is 40%. We want to increase that to 50% so it lines up with all of our other discount fares. And then also, right now, to qualify, you have to be at 185% or lower uh, of the federal poverty level in terms of your earnings. We want to increase that to 250% of the federal poverty level. Um, the, 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 re, the way we got to that number, it sounds nice, but um, also we looked at what the minimum wage is uh, by how, and then kind of applied it on a household basis so that somebody making the minimum wage would uh, qualify for this, where in the past they would not. Something else that we've heard as we're, out, we're doing our outreach is that there's just a lot of low-income people that are not even aware that the program exists. So we also want to try to reach out more to nonprofits, social service agencies, to get it, the word out there that this does exist. And then lastly, we also heard a lot of complaints that it is a kind of an arduous application process. So we um, want to see if here again we can start forming partnerships with social service agencies and others to help with the application process. Currently, we do contract with um, the city and county of Denver, their social services, and it's not just limited to people who are Denver residents, but see if we can do more of that, again, just to you know, kind of help to move the process along and make things simpler. Um, youth fairs, this is another big one. We are proposing uh, for this next year uh, a pilot program where we would have zero fare for youth. So anywhere you're going, 19 and under, would ride for free on the system. Um, the reason we're calling it a pilot is it's fairly expensive. We expect it to be approximately $5 million a year hit on the amount of uh, revenue we would get from the fare box. So what we'd like to do is establish this, see how much data we can get, and then look to outside uh, partners for funding, whether that's the state, local government, school districts, just we'll, we'll, we'll have our hand out. But uh, point being, uh, we really, we were, our general manager in particular was very interested in this. We, you know, the intent being, um, you know, there are a lot of kids that just aren't able to access either the schools they want to attend, uh, employment opportunities, and we figured this would be a, a, you know, a really good equalizer for helping out with that. For student fairs, and by students now we mean uh, college students, right now we do have the semester pass. That's something that CU takes, uh, uh, participates in, the Auraria campus, BU. Works great for them because they have m more traditional students. All of their campuses are well served by transit. But when we're reaching out to community colleges where we've had no participation, uh, one of the things we heard is, yeah, the, you know, the semester pass is great, but we have a lot of students that are you know, only taking one or two classes at a time. They may be coming right from work. So the idea that, it, that the college pass is predicated on, which is that everyone participates in it, so it's almost like an insurance model, just does not work for a community college or a technical school. So what we've proposed instead is to create a semester pass for those schools. And uh, they would be a student who is interested in that uh, could just buy a semester pass, and the semester pass would be $88. And 
and the, the only purpose of showing that table is just to see what the savings would be over, say, buying a monthly pass instead. And then uh, with our accessoride system, currently we do not have a live discount. So a couple of things going on here. One is that we are just pro we are proposing that the the fares in general would be reduced for accessoride, but also that we would introduce the live discount to accessoride. Uh, customers as well. So there'd be some pretty substantial savings for our low-income customers that do rely on that service. Um, so without walking through all of the pieces here, I think really the big thing to focus on is kind of the first bullet there. Uh, I want to reemphasize, so adults that are using the discount fares can travel to any destination within the district, including the airport. Uh, for a discount price, and the monthly passes, as I said, would be, okay, I've forgotten the number already, to roughly $23, so um, I think that's pretty, going to be a pretty, uh, I hate the word game changer, but I'll throw that out there uh, for our customers. And then just jumping, um, just in the interest of time here again, uh, the eco pass, or, or I'm sorry, what, one of the other things that we heard, and we used to have a system that was sort of similar to this, where we did provide assistance to nonprofits to help them, uh, you know, for passes for their cl uh, client populations. What we're proposing as part of this program is that we would create a, an assistance program. We would start it out at a million dollars uh, for those social, social service agencies that... Now, while we have the LIV program, the process, as I said, you do have to apply through the state's benefit system, can take three weeks plus in order for the processing before you actually get your pass. Recognizing that there are agencies that serve people with immediate needs, whether it's the homeless population or, uh, say, victims of domestic violence that need passes right away, we'd like to create a program where those services can provide, uh, apply for a transit assistance grant where we would be able to apply the, uh, or provide them with passes. Additionally, we also want to propose uh, recognizing also that there are certain businesses that may not want to take advantage of the EcoPass because of whatever constraints or limitations they have, that we'd be able to sell to them, uh, apply to that for them a, a bulk discount of 10% for a minimum of $1,500. And then also related to the EcoPass, in addition to simplifying the pricing, we'd also have a two-year uh, contract price because we've heard from a lot of businesses that given the fluctuation in prices, it's really hard for them to do budgeting on a year-to-year -year basis, trying to figure out what it's going to cost the next year. So we figured going on a two-year period, that would help uh, stabilize their prices and give them a little bit more predictability. Um, we have, we've already had two virtual meetings on this, um, and I took out the slide that had all the events we're going to be at because there's a zillion. The closest event that's coming up, I think on Wednesday, September, Wednesday, May 4th, we will be at the, we'll have a pop-up at the uh, Boulder Farmer's Market. In addition, we do have a couple of more public meetings come up, coming up, uh, one later this week. Um, that one will be live, another one next week, and then one more virtual. Those are all on our website. And in addition, on our website, I want to emphasize this, we do have a comment in a survey form where you can put in comments, support it, you like it, you don't like it, there are things you like, there are specific things you don't like. So love to hear any feedback that you have, of course, tonight as well. But um, encourage you, yeah, to, to get on our website on that. And the, the address is up there. If for some reason you don't have the presentation in front of you, just Google RTD Fair Study. It's the first thing that pops up, and it'll take you right to probably where you need to go. And I think... I thought I took this out, but yes, this slide does show uh, upcoming uh, uh, meetings that we do have. Um, one next week. The two, the two live ones coming up are in Denver, but we do have um, two more online meetings, one in English and one in Spanish. And for all of our meetings, we've uh, made sure that we've had one in English and one exclusively in Spanish. So, I, yeah, that is it. So, happy to answer any questions now or... And off to Patrick on the Northwest. Uh, thank you, Chris. Uh, um, <coughs> uh, one clarifying question, and then some statements.
sense. But um, you said May 4th. I'm assuming you meant the May 11th and the 17th for events? Uh, yes. Okay. Sorry. Cool. No, they did just I'm a, uh, just uh, yeah, I'm, yeah. Uh, I'm still in April somewhere. So. And then um, just because, you know, I read a CP article last week uh, about yeah. the RTD boards voting this week, I believe, on uh, oh, the prepare so for July and August. Yeah, uh, yeah so two things going on there. Uh, yes, so the, the RTD board will be doing that. And then in addition to that, I, I can't remember whether this was um, noted in the article or not, Tomorrow night, we will also be going to uh, the board planning, finance and planning committee to just let them know that it, it, as far as, it, so our schedule has us, um, our assumption is that we'd be going to the board of directors for, with the full package of the fair recommendations in July. One of the things we heard when we were doing outreach, especially from the school districts, is if you're going to do zero fair for youth, oh, and I'm sorry, let me back up. Then the intent would be that the uh, fares would go into effect. There's a lot of work that has to go on behind the scenes. The fares would go into effect uh, beginning of Jan or first quarter of next year, preferably January. But what we heard from the school districts is, well, if you're going to do a pilot free fare for youth, it would work a lot better for us if you could establish that with the academic school year, which would be obviously August, September. So we're going to the board tomorrow night to just tell, just kind of let them know, not necessarily even ask permission, but say, we, we're not considering this a done deal yet, because we know you haven't acted on it, but we want to start talking and working with our partners at the school districts and others to see how, exactly how this would work. And so we are going to start working on this now. Um, so our hope, of course, is that the board does approve all this in July. And so if it does, then we'll be ready for the, the uh, zero fare for youth pilot to pick up um, right after the zero fare for better air, which would be July, August. Yeah. So then beginning September, we would start the uh, free fare for youth pilot so that it coincides with the school year. Okay, so. then um, another thing about fares is... Um, you know, you're mentioning partners of school districts and then some buses even here in town service some schools. Does the district uh, put some money forth into those routes or how, how's that cooperation? But then, and then also just a general question about fares um, because, you know, our RTD is partly tax payer funded um, organization, but then uh, where, like, what part of the budget do the fares go or is it just all in a lump sum? Yeah. Where, 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 do you, where does ridership <laughs> money go? So right now, pre-pandemic, yeah, the point of the pandemic, everything comes down to it, but pre-pandemic, we approximately 20 plus, a little bit higher than that percent of our operating costs were covered by what we call the fare box recovery ratio. So your fare is paid about 20%. Federal grants and the RTD sales tax uh, covered the remainder of that. Since the pandemic, that number has plummeted. We're down to somewhere in the low teens, uh, let's say 10, 13 percent, something like that. So our fares are already covering a smaller percentage of our operating costs, and that's kind of one of the reasons we're our current general manager has been a little bit more liberal with the, in the past when we've started fair studies, we've always had specific revenue targets, and this time we were a little bit looser with that, with the recognition that there are, the fair is already covering a lower percentage of costs, so why not just lower that and see if we can backfill that with other funds. And you had another, I'm sorry, you had another question on there as well, and I don't know, I uh, forgot what that was already. Oh. Yeah, so one of the things we'd like to do, and, you know, we don't even have a good sense of what this would be yet, um, you know, have our hand out to either a school district, uh, the state, anyone. Um, it, 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 as far as the zero fare for youth, a few other states have done this. Washington State's a real good example where they have set up a grant for local transit agencies to apply for. Uh, to cover, to actually cover the cost of, implement, of uh, op implementing that. We 
we're really just starting our lobbying efforts on that, so um, I can't give you any good information yet on who we really think would cover that uh, chunk of change, but uh, we're hoping, I guess that's a good way to put it, we're hoping it's popular enough that uh, somebody might be willing to help us. <laughs> Well, yeah, and I'm hoping school districts see the value of public transit to then also be a value to the young children to gain independence. Yeah, you know, I think one of the challenges we may have, and this is just me speaking personally, yeah, we, we have pretty good school ridership um, in Boulder County, Denver, some of the suburban districts, it's a lot less so, so, you know, I'm thinking it may be more difficult, you know, if we, when we approach, and I'm making this up, say, Arapaho County, you say, well, you know, are you going to be willing to put in, and well, none of our kids do, it's a, but it's certainly something, uh, we, you know, we're going to start the discussion on. Well, yeah. I, I think it's an interesting idea because, you know, I, I studied in a country that had no school buses, and they just had public transit, and they put down a school Hot sign on. that says, all right, this bus is now a school bus. Um, but it's a great way to get people into transit as yeah. well for the next generation. So. Yeah, and, and following up on that, and that's I think one of the reasons that is for our general manager in particular, this has been a really important issue. Um, she believes strongly that by introducing transit to kids, you know, that's a way of, for lack of a better way, marketing it out, you know, to get lifelong transit riders. Hearing how small a percentage of RTD's total revenue is provided by fares, I'm wondering whether you've studied doing away with fares altogether. Yeah, the, the challenge, going into the study, as I said in the past, we've typically had specific fare revenue targets. This time in, in our discussions with our, fi our uh, finance department, we figured if we came, if we had a reduction that was somewhere in the range of around 20 percent, then we could probably still get away with not having to do any service cuts. Anything lower than that, then uh, it would start to impact uh, the amount of service hours that we could provide. So it, it, we, we, we did a lot of back and forth on this, but you know, running the financial model going, you know, there's always the push-pull, but by lowering, by eliminating the regional fare and then even lowering all the fares, we pretty much hit rock bottom to get, it, it, we're at the 20% now, so anything lower than that, then we would likely see service cuts, which, you know, and I'm making up a number, but any, even a 5% cut in service, um, look for our service planners is usually pretty painful, yeah, so. So with the proposed fare reductions, you're saying fares would still provide 20 percent? No, we're probably hovering around 10 now. 10 now? 10 percent-ish, yeah. And then oh, with, I'm sorry, with the cut. Reduce the fares. So the, with the, with the with the financial model is showing, I'm kind of pulling this out of my head now, so I hope I have this accurate in my mental picture. We will see, we expect to see an uptick in ridership because of the lower fares, but not enough to offset the loss in revenue from the lower fares. So if my memory is correct, we'd still be hovering somewhere around 10%, but I don't remember the exact number. Okay, so you're saying that the increase in ridership would roughly offset the reduction? Not, there? Or not quite, no. Not so we'd still have, we still anticipate a loss of revenue, but, uh, but some of that, yes, would be offset with higher ridership, but at least that's what the model is showing. So I see. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Quinn, Longmont's had free fares for quite some time, and I think the city subsidizes the fare. Is that correct? 
So is this a, a change to the subsidy that the city will be paying, or am I understanding that come January will be individuals will be paying the fare? Uh, I can point out. Yeah, thank you. Than <laughs> than Chris, sorry. And the thank um, you, and I don't know the answer. <laughs> we need to take a. We're going to have to take a real close look at this because this. It's kind of a game changer as far as the whole reason why we bought up fares in the first place, the fare box. We bought up all the money that was going into the fare box. We said we will pay for that if we can get free fares for everyone, no matter what. No cards, nothing. And so um, with this new model, we're going to have to really talk about that at these different policy levels to see if we want to continue that or not. Because it's, it's a great benefit for folks in the city, but if this new fare structure is what we think it is, and it's, it's it's offsetting a lot of the reasons why we didn't have ridership before, because our argument at the time was the fares that RTD is, is charging for us in Longmont are the same as in Denver, same as in Littleton, same as in Boulder, same as in Golden. We're not getting the same bang for our buck, so we would like to buy those up and prove that we have people who will ride the bus, and certainly we had some pretty good growth in our small bus system of four routes. So we d we'll need to take another look at that, and we'll need to come to this group and to City Council and really have those discussions about how do we want to approach this in the next eight months before this, or five, <laughs> it's, a, it's less than that now, it's seven months, um, before the new fares take place, because it's, it's, a huge, it's a huge factor for where we go in the future. Well, as a follow-up question, I wonder if you have data of um, how many um, persons under 19, age 19 have been riding the buses. I know um, I said I ride the 323, and I do see teenagers, because that goes by the high school, um, ride that bus. I'd say I see four or five every time, every time I'm on that round. So I wonder if you see um, what, what you see in terms of ridership in that age group. Yeah, well, one of the challenges we have is we're not allowed, we, we do an onboard survey every year, every couple of years, every, every couple of years where we actually have people that come, a survey agency that comes on board and surveys our riders. We are not allowed to survey under 18, so our data is somewhat, um, what's the word I'm looking for, um, pres presumptive, yeah, we don't have solid data on that. Um, we, so... Short answer, I, we don't have good numbers. One of the things that, and I, not only would probably be able to tell me, uh, tell, speak to this a little bit better, we do have a sense of at least, as you mentioned, you know, by the schools, we definitely see higher ridership. So I think our service planners have been able to kind of extrapolate from some of the data we have uh, based on, you know, what the ups and downs are between the beginning and the ending of the school year and then suppose, assume that, you know, certain percentage of that may be related to students that are riding to the schools. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chair, just real quick, I oh, just want to do a time check with okay. you. We're at almost 7.30, so we've got about 20 more minutes yeah. for RTD, so I just wanted to give everybody a heads up that we're trying to get it so you can have your comments at the end as well. So. I will hand it. Hand it over to Patrick Stanley, who will provide you with an update on the Northwest Rail. In, in reference to just Phil's set, why don't we hold our questions till the very end? Uh, thank you. Good evening. Um, Patrick Stanley, uh, Manager of Engineering Programs at RTD. And uh, thank you for having us here tonight to give you an update. Um, so real quick, I'm just going to start with a basic kind of overview of the Northwest Rail uh, for everybody that uh, might need a refresher course. but. Um, Northwest Rail was part of the 2004 Fast Tracks boat. Um, it is a 42-mile segment that goes from Denver Union Station to Longmont. Um, the first six miles of that was built as part of the B-Line, opened in 2016. Uh, that's an overhead electrified segment of rail uh, that operates an RTD dedicated and uh, controlled track. Um, in 2010, uh, we did the uh, environmental evaluation, uh, which looked at 55 round trips per day. 11 stations and a full double tracking for the entire corridor. Um, at that time, uh, we didn't have a dedicated funding source that uh, weren't able to build it at that time, so um, we kind of continued to study it. 2013, we did the Northwest Area Mobility Study, the NAMS project, 
uh, which looked at um, really um, implementing the Northwest Rail in physical segments, so you know Denver to, to Westminster, et cetera, and, and kind of in chunks. Um, at that particular time, it was identified that the Northwest Rail would be a longer term project, and that was identified between the stakeholders and RTD at that time. Uh, 2016, mentioned the um, B line did open, and now here in 2017, the concept for the peak service came up uh, really from our stakeholders uh, to RTD to look at a peak service operation. <clears throat> so the first question is what is peak service? Uh, so the peak service uh, that we're pro proposing uh, that we're studying right now is uh, three weekday morning trips from Longmont to Denver and three weekday evening trips back from Denver to Longmont. Uh, we're partnering with uh, local jurisdictions to plan six new stations along the corridor. Uh, we're also looking at feasible um, potential uh, means facility locations here in Longmont, uh, just mostly because we're going to be running a different technology for the train. Uh, we won't be looking at an overhead powered train for this 35-mile uh, segment um, that we're for the extension. Uh, we're going to, of course, we're going to be operating on the, and let me back up a little bit, I should have said this in the first slide, but the 35-mile the extension from the existing B line will operate on the existing BNSF freight tracks. So obviously uh, that means we've got to talk to the BNSF. Uh, they're obviously a big player in that particular uh, arena. Uh, we're also evaluating potential train types. It's not our goal to select a specific vehicle as part of the study, but we do want to make sure that the type of vehicles that we need to operate are available. Um, and then, of course, uh, you know, there's a lot of partnership opportunities out there. One in particular that we're um, a little bit excited about to explore is the Front Range Passenger Rail. So as I mentioned, uh, um, six new stations uh, working from the south up. Uh, downtown Westminster, Broomfield 116th, uh, Flatiron Station, downtown Louisville, Boulder Junction at Depot Square, and then here in downtown Longmont which is located the, near the first and main uh, project. So RTD is leading the project, but we're obviously not, not doing it alone. Uh, so we have a study advisory team, which is uh, made up of our uh, representatives from the local stakeholders as far, and as well as uh, jurisdictional or uh, transportation um, partners um, in the area. The people that you see here on the screen here make up our SAT, uh, provide us guidance and input throughout the process. Um, Got the no-fill pretty well and it's part of that part of that team. <clears throat> so um, why is peak service something that uh, might be worth looking at right now? So um, given the fact we have limited resources, um, it would it would provide a potential for us to maybe bring a Northwest Rail solution to the to the Northwest area sooner rather than later. Uh, it's a cost-effective approach to get some service started while we uh, continue to pursue funding for a full-day operation. Uh, accomplishes some initial track safety and track upgrades. Um, you know, positive train control, which I'm sure many people have probably heard about, would be required if we ran uh, commuter rail service on the freight rail. Um, but getting that safety uh, safety system implement, in, implemented early on allows us to build upon that. Uh, we're not the first. We wouldn't be the first ones to do this. There are other locations that have looked at a peak service and they've been able to build upon that as the ridership grows. And then, you know, it, it allows us to um, address some of the ridership concerns today while we plan, uh, plan for the future. So we don't have a set start date uh, for the service. This is a, this is a study at this point. Um, we're, trying to, we're trying to evaluate what we call the common set of facts. We're looking at what is the infrastructure needed uh, to build this, um, and then how much is that going to cost? Um, how much does it cost to build? How much does it cost to operate? What type of agreements do we have to have in place? Uh, what is the ridership benefit, benefits, impacts, et cetera? Um, which is what we call the common set of facts that we'll have at the end of the study um, in order to make some decisions and move forward um, in, a, in a direction on the Northwest Rail, as well as uh, looking at potential funding sources throughout. So a little bit on the study schedule, and I apologize, I'm rushing a little bit through here <laughs> to get through everything here. But uh, study schedule, um, it's a five milestone process that we're working through right now. We are at the tail end of milestone three right now, which is really defining the initial base footprint for what it would actually take to do the six new stations, the uh, passing sightings for the BNSF, um, you know, in the, in the three, uh, three round trips per day. Uh, milestones one and two are really fact-finding. Um, processes, really looking at what is peak service, what, is, what has changed since we did the EE, 
Obviously, that was 2010, so the number of things have changed since that particular time. And we needed to find out what, you know, what, what do the conditions look like today. And then moving forward in the milestones four and five, it's when we want to look at some um, potential partnerships and opportunities that might be out there and look at uh, what are the strategies and next steps to move forward. Um, and in, in total, at the end, um, it should wrap up towards the end of this, end of this year. So real quick, I wanted to touch on, we did have our first touch point community uh, involvement. Um, this was, uh, we had a, uh, two open houses. One was uh, January 31st in Boulder. And then we had, uh, our second one was in Westminster on February 2nd. It was an in-house meeting. Uh, we had about a total of 195 total visitors to both of those, um, both of those open houses. At the event itself, we got about 29 total comment cards, but we did give out, um, we had an online meeting that was run at the same time, which had the exact same content, which allowed people to view the content at their, at their schedule. And on that particular online meeting, we got about 3,300 total views of the, um, of the presentation and included about 170 or so uh, completed surveys. And then on the web, RTD web page itself, we got about 350 comments and uh, sign-ups for emails. So real quick, right after the open houses, we had we sat down with the SAT. We kind of went through, okay, what do we think we heard at these meetings? And in general, what we heard was there's a either a neutral or a positive attitude towards the Northwest Rail, and there were there were some I think um, let's say reserved excitement, perhaps um, that RTD was still looking at this, trying to find a solution to the Northwest uh, Rail solution. Um, there were quite a few concerns with um, you know uh, reverse commute. Uh, since it only goes one way in the morning, uh, there's not really an opportunity for somebody from Denver to come back the other direction. Uh, there were some concerns about additional stations, potentially at Gun Barrel or Niwot in particular. Um, a lot of people had questions about what is the BNSF or Front Range Passenger Rail partnership, you know, what does that look like? A lot of questions about what, what's the difference between this concept and the full service concept, in particular as it, as it regard, in regards to ridership and cost. And then, uh, you know, we had a number of comments from people that didn't have non, had non-traditional commutes, maybe somebody in the service industry or hospitality um, that doesn't really commute at a regular time. And uh, growth around the stations, what, are, what does the nature of the stations look like? What does that development look like? Is it private, public? Um, you know, what, what are the impacts on the existing infrastructure at the station locations? And then finally, the big question that uh, we all know is one that we have to address is what would happen if, if peak service uh, turns out to be maybe an infeasible option at this, and what, are, what would we do in that, in that scenario? So then we had a chance to actually look at the comments themselves and we just kind of gut check, make sure that we were hearing uh, what people were saying, and for the most part, uh, there were a lot of parallels here. Um, generally, uh, some happy, you know, some, I think, excitement that we were still looking um, at the, uh, the Northwest Rail at, at, in general. Uh, same comments we had about the stations and the locations. A lot of people were still uh, mostly Gun Barrel and Niawat in particular. Um, had a number of comments about the integrated service with RTD. How would this integrate in with other service uh, services that we're providing in the areas? Um, you know, what would there be any reductions to any other services potentially as a as a result of the Northwest Rail possibly coming in? Uh, questions about the land use. Uh, you know, I, this particular one, people had concerns about maybe being pushed out of the station areas, um, you know, people, existing residents. And, of course, construction, which is a little ways off, but um, if we do move this into a uh, future phase, that's something obviously we'd have to take into, cons excuse me, take into consideration. So one of the questions we asked was, uh, please select the reasons why the service may not work for you peak service. And most of these, the, the bigger numbers are really related more towards the actual nature of the service itself. itself, itself. Um, not providing weekend service, as an example, is the first one. Midday service, evening service, um, and direction of service. Those are kind of the primary pieces, which is, I think, to be expected a little bit with such a limited um, peak service type option. Uh, really, towards the end, uh, it was really more of the uh, the station's not necessarily being in a location that was convenient to use the service. So next we asked about um, kind of the benefits. What are the benefits that people might see uh, with the Northwest Rail? And it's a little bit encouraging to see that a lot of these numbers were all fairly high. 
Uh, so to me, that indicates that there's a lot of different reasons why um, people could potentially use the Northwest Rail or would use the Northwest Rail. Um, but you can see at the beginning, you know, being stuck in traffic, uh, which probably doesn't surprise anybody, getting out of the traffic jams, reduce vehicle emissions, um, opportunity to use, read, work, rest, um, and then new transportation opportunities, kind of the first top four. And really down towards the end was the reduced uh, transportation costs. And that's really the cost personally uh, that you would have for your gas, parking downtown, maintenance of your vehicles, that sort of thing. Now finally here in Longmont, actually we asked the question, so you know, what, what are the most important factors to consider for a maintenance facility siting? Um, I should note that most of the people that answered this actually don't live around the uh, locations of the maintenance facility that we're proposing, but um, you, it, these, these are what you would expect in a study like this, noise impacts, air quality, traffic disruptions, uh, really more towards the end, or, you know, your private property impacts and visual impacts. So uh, where do we go from here? So we're going to continue to define the initial footprint. Um, you know, we want to use the public input that we got and see what that notifies us, or what that tells us, and how that informs the study, and uh, make adjustments as necessary based on those comments. Uh, we're going to continue to compile the common set of facts. That's going to be something that happens throughout the entire process, really all the way up to the end. And then uh, we're looking at some, uh, the next round of open houses. Uh, we say late spring, early summer, but I think we've had some recent conversations with our SCT that we're probably looking more, more uh, summer to late summer probably for those, uh, those open houses. But that's uh, kind of predetermined yet. We need to have, I think, some, some uh, pretty serious conversations with ASR to be on the best timing for that. So, and that concludes the Northwest Rail presentation. I apologize, I had to rush through it a little bit there, but <clears throat> any questions now? Or? Okay, the brain, okay. I'm going to kick it back to Chris real quick, and he's going to give a quick update on the Longmont Station. Yeah, and this is sort of related to the Northwest Rail. Um, just a little bit of history. Back when the contract bids came in for the A line and the G line, in uh, as, as part of the fast tracks plan, the, there was some extra money left over, and so the RTD board it, it was approximately 17 million dollars uh, allocated that for the first and main station of the downtown Longmont station. So with the intent of that being, you know, knowing that we couldn't necessarily do the rail right away, we could at least establish it as a transit hub, and that could work as a transit hub for the 119 BRT and also for the rail when it is established. So, um, and I haven't been working on this, so Phil, you can correct me on the, the planner who has been working on this couldn't be here tonight, so I hope I get all this right. Phil will correct me if I don't. Um, we have been working very closely with the city on a, uh, what is known as an IMP or an infrastructure master plan that has been completed. And now we have signed uh, an intergovernmental agreement with the city so that the intent being that the money that RTD would have used to develop the station we will be providing to the city so the city will take care of the construction and uh, of the facility, which will include, and you see out there, the, uh, approximately 10 bus gates. Uh, the, the city also will be in charge of land acquisition, and then we will, we RTD will provide the funds uh, kind of as a lump sum to the city uh, with the expected project completion somewhere around the 2025 time frame. So, and I hope I can answer any questions you might have on that. Hold on. <laughs> Hi, Ali Mansapai with RTD, project manager for Colorado 119 BRT. So, um, from 2017 to 2019, uh, RTD engaged in the planning and environmental linkages study. Uh, which was the aftermath of NAMS, the Northwest Area Mobility Study, which identified uh, future BRT corridors in the Northwest region um, of the Denver metro area. 
Uh, after that happened, um, the number one corridor identified as part of that uh, NAM study um, was the Colorado 119, and therefore the PEL happened, and uh, here we are with some money to um, partner with CDOT and others to make it a reality. The goals are outlined here, as you see, uh, the future travel demand um, is a huge issue, uh, first and last mile connectivity, um, optimizing the transit services um, between Boulder and Longmont, and a reduction of transit travel times um, are definitely the, the huge goals for, for this project. It's a truly multimodal project. It's going to have a bikeway right in the center of the diagonal. Um, we are really excited about what the outcome of this project is going to be and how it's going to become a model for future BRT corridors, not only in this region, but really elsewhere, elsewhere in um, RTD's district. So. I know that map on the right is a little bit hard to see, but um, probably you could see it better on your screens. But one thing to understand about the, what is Colorado 119 BRT project is it's really two projects with, within the scope, if you will. What you see being the diagonal piece, so the southern limit, Foothills Parkway, to the northern limit at Hover, that's the safety and mobility project that we are partnering with CDOT and Boulder County to build it. The rest of it, what you see, the extension to the south and the extension to the north, um, are the BRT improvements, including a brand new park and ride in North Longmont and the improvements on CU campus. Uh, on the south side are what RTD is doing on its own. So that's not with CDOT. It's going to be completely done by RTD and its partners. Um, again, what you see here, um, we already talked about the PEL and the vision, um, but PEL had managed lanes in, in, um, as part of their preferred alternative. We did a thorough traffic study as part of the safety and mobility um, project that we're working with CDOT and others, and uh, decided that the best bang for our buck is what is called the Q bypass lanes. So these are these bypass lanes that um, get implemented, get built uh, to bypass the Q as it sort of uh, implies in its name. Uh, so the bus could get to the intersection uh, way ahead of the, you know, not getting stuck in the back of the queue, and then get its own signal, cross the intersection, do its alighting and boarding, and then get him back into the general purpose lane and proceeding. Um, again, bikeway is a key piece of this multimodal effort. Um, there are other projects that feed into the big BRT project, um, one key one is the Kaufman Street Busway, which we've been working with Phil and his staff to um, make sure that gets done correctly, um, and uh, you know, making this a multimodal uh, uh, corridor. And uh, CDOT's call on the 119, uh, we talked about the safety and mobility project, uh, and we talked about how managed lanes were infeasible, and we went with the Q bypass lanes. So that's um, what we're going forward with. Um, you see the key improvements identified. If you um, um, pay attention to, to the legend, it will identify where the bikeway underpasses are, the queue bypass lanes, um, the locations of the park and rides, um, and um, where the stations and platforms are going to be in the diagonal piece.
um, other roadway improvements, um, an adaptive signal system that CDOT Region 4 has already implemented. It's going to make uh, traffic signals work far better in the diagonal piece of the project. Uh, the cycle lengths um, adjust during the day. It senses a real-time traffic and adjusts accordingly instead of the traditional, you know, having AM, PM, and off-peak plans. So it changes all the time. Um, a lot of signing, striping, lighting uh, at parking rides and at the platforms, and a whole complete reconstruction of uh, the intersection at Colorado 52, which is also IBM Drive to the to the west. The oh right. So on the graphic to the right, you'll see what the Q bypass lane, a good example of it is at 63rd, where you see the park and ride in the middle of the highway. You know, the, what is the meadowy, grassy area right now. Uh, there is an animated version of this graphic, so where you click on it, you'll see the bus coming into the maroon on the, uh, you know, left side of the intersection, if you will, proceeds to the park and ride, does its aligning and boarding, proceeds to the traffic signal, and then that little horizontal bar turns green ahead of the general purpose traffic. The bus travels through the intersection um, and then back to the general purpose traffic on the right side of the, the intersection. Uh, that's how it's going to work. Uh, that's what the Q bypass lane is, is about. And uh, um, the, the park and rides facility, we talked about the brand new one at Park Ridge, which we are partnering pretty heavily with the city um, to acquire that right away needed for that park and ride facility from the developer to the city and then to us. So we can build it. We have the basic layout already worked out at that location, and then a whole bunch of stops, as mentioned in the uh, first graphic, um, in the cities of Longmont and Boulder. Uh, there are going to be BRT grade stops. Not all of them are going to have shelters, and that is because of the lack of public right of way So if we have the room, uh, we will install them. If not, it's going to be just a bench and a flag. We have uh, done that with both uh, the cities of Longmont and Boulder staff um, two rounds of meetings each to make sure we will do the best we can with those BRT stops. Um, I suppose we should have started with this slide, but yeah, it's a <laughs> BRT is a reliable, convenient, faster, and more frequent service than the traditional uh, bus service and there are going to be two variations of it for the Colorado 119 BRT, the orange route and the blue route, serving different parts of uh, Longmont and Boulder. Very similar to Flatiron Flyer, which is that one. <laughs> so um, that's what I was talking about, the blue pattern. And you'll see the headways, the, the frequency, rather, the weekdays and the holidays as well as the orange route, serving different parts of both cities. Here's another look at it. Those are the BRT grade stops we were looking at, you know, again, identifying them in Boulder and Longmont. Um, orange basically, the orange route basically replaces the, replaces the J route from University of Colorado um, and um, the blue route starts at downtown Boulder and replaces the bolt. And with that, I, we're going to wait till the end for uh, questions.
just want to say how much we appreciate RTD and their staff coming here. We, we get them once a year, at least, and so we really appreciate their time and, and efforts, and you can see how busy they are, and especially how much they touch Longmont with what they're doing, so thanks. Do we want to ask any questions from the board? Um, well, yes. <laughs> I, I, I have many questions, just not enough time. Um, which I would love to go another hour, but I know not everyone else would. Um, uh, with FRPR, uh, that has to come to a vote, uh, I believe, um, from our citizens. So I'm just curious, you know, because 2004, uh, to make a joke about my age, I was 14 when Fast Tracks was passed, and uh, Longmont is very anxious about getting a rail, and now it seems like RTD is kind of uh, siding with FRPR, but then that ultimately has to be passed by voters, so I'm just curious how, how, how is that going to campaign for the public that already is kind of wary of RTD? Yeah, uh, th that's a good question. So I, uh, first thing I guess I would like to say, the, the peak service study that we're doing right now is really to look at, you know, uh, what it would take for RTD to run peak service. Uh, we do obviously want to keep an eye on what a potential partnership would be with Front Range Passenger Rail. Um, I think there's a real opportunity there uh, that might open some doors that are maybe closed to us right now, uh, maybe in particular probably um, regarding funding, uh, maybe federal funding in particular. So um, I think we're keeping our eye really closely on what's happening with the Front Range Passenger Rail. They're also doing a study right now. We don't know if they're going to be, I can't, I don't want to speak for them too much, but I think there's still a question about 2004 versus 2000, I'm sorry, 2024 versus 2026 vote. Um, but Andy Karzian at the Front Range Passenger will be the best one to answer that question um, as far as timing. But um, So I think our first goal that we're trying to do is, is find out what are the facts for peak service and what, what what picture does that paint, and where does that put us, and what, what possibility do we have to move forward, regardless maybe of Front Range Passenger Rail being there as well. So um, I hope that answers your question. But I think, um, you know, if it does end up being a partnership, obviously that's something that we'll, we'll have to address together with uh, Front Range Passenger Rail and how that would work. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm still excited of this getting done. Um, and then an, another question about the Loma Station. RTD board committed to construct the station in 2011. It'll be done hopefully 2025. Uh, can someone just explain the, the length of that process, why, why it takes 14, 15 years? Um, I'm not sure I'm the perfect one to answer. <laughs> I can help answer. Um, part of it was RTD did not have the money at the time that they made they were just getting into that agreement with uh, with the um, what was the acronym? Eagle P3. Yeah, Eagle P3 was the name of the project that really did the whole A line and the West line and those different things. And uh, it was part of that that we started to. It was because of the way the contract was structured that we were able to get the cost savings. And of course, we raised our hand first first thing and said, "Hey." We'd like to realize that cost savings up here because we don't think we'll see anything soon. So that started the process in 2011, and then we've been going through the process. Uh, RT was pretty sincere about the idea that we needed to do an infrastructure master plan to make sure that everything was in place for the station to be at that mm. location. And then, uh, yeah, it's just bureaucracy uh, yeah. in the finest. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and I hope uh, that you know we a little bit touched on land use, and I, I hope RTDs, I, I'm sure you guys are, because the governor was trying to also tackle land use um, that has unfortunately failed, um, because it, it's really, you need both to have a good transit system, um, a good plan. Um, but really, I don't know, I, I would just like to end, you know, because, you know, it, it, I think uh, overall we're, we're always dealing with the what came first, the, ch the chicken or the egg. And, uh, you know, I, I look at examples. So, like, you know, Houston, granted, bigger city, but they redesigned their entire network, um, essentially doubled and increased ridership. Um, so I, I think thinking outside the box and not waiting for riders, but maybe building, building and they will come. So 
Mr. Stanley, have you initiated conversations with BNSF? Uh, yes, we have. So, in fact, um, it took us a little bit longer than we were hoping it would take. Um, but do we, we do actually have a contract with them right now. We just, uh, I think it was actually last week, we issued them a notice to proceed to provide 30% basic engineering plans. Um, they will give us a price estimate, you know, a cost estimate for what it's going to take for us to operate on their on their particular line. So we know for we know for a fact that there's going to be several sightings um, that will have to be um, part of the project. Um, and those would the way those would work is the BNSF would actually pull over on those sightings during a certain time period, a certain chunk of time. So say the peak morning service, they would pull over, and then we would have operational priority on the tracks during that time. But right now it's all a single track. So that's one of the pieces that we need to get from them is a better understanding of where those sightings need to be, how many of them need to be, how long do they need to be, um, as well as what type of pre track improvements would need to happen potentially to run co uh, passenger service on their freight rails. So uh, we have talked to them. They've been, they've been uh, at the table. We've been talking with them for a little bit. Um, so hopefully we'll uh, start getting a little bit uh, quicker movement on that here just shortly. So... It's not a full go, but uh, a come to the table and negotiate what might work. We want to understand what the cost is, and we want to we want to understand what their what their requirements are going to be for us to to operate on their line. And in order to do that, that's what we want to engage with them. We've got a contract to do some work with them, so that we can fully understand what those those are. Uh, so at the end of the day, we'll have a cost estimate from them on what it would take for us to do, as well as what infrastructure is needed to do it. Okay, so it's a contract to make an assessment, and then you'll go forward from there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Uh, and um, Mr. Um, Amansafi, um, I, I have you, is there any other uh, method under consideration besides underpasses for the bike route on the BRT? And, and the reason why I ask that is, uh, I think you know what the county commissioners, there was quite a lot of, um, concern about safety and underpass involvement and uh, with the bike route. And I, I just wondered if there was anything else that could happen. There was a lot of conversation about NIWAT, um, where NIWAT Road comes into, about it being unsafe. And this was just listening to other comments. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to get your input on sure, if anything um, else is being considered. I can definitely have the the person who understands it better, the project manager for the bikeway, uh, get back with you on that. But yes, there were definitely uh, other um, options were considered overpass, <laughs> for one, which would be, then you would be subject to weather, of course, and then also, um, I believe it was more expensive to build. And the way it is, they're hurting for money. They only um, have secured enough funds for most of the underpasses, not all of them. Mm -hmm. So they're looking at the last series of the TIP grants, I believe, um, and uh, perhaps the raise uh, grant, which we should be here in next month or two. Yeah. To see if it would pay pay for them. But um, Stacy Proctor from Boulder County would be a better better suited to answer your, your question. And I can definitely convey that. Well, I know that. one of the concerns is that it narrows down to 12 feet through the underpass and it's a mixed use with pedestrians. And thank you, Chair Lehner, for sending out that article about um, intermixing with um, bicycles and pedestrians. Um, so I just wondered if there was a solution to that or a way to address those concerns. Um, at the touch points, I believe there are 16 feet, but then it tapers back to 12 feet. Yeah. Uh, of course, making it 16 feet obviously would be a better option, but it's going to be quite a bit more money. Yeah, understood. Right. I think so, it's just a concern about the speed yes. of bicyclists, you know, combined with pedestrians. That, you know, mm -hmm. 
You have an excellent point. Yeah, with the e-bikes one now, um, I believe all classes of e-bikes are going to be allowed on it. So classes one, two, and three, that means up to 28 miles per hour. Yeah, it becomes a challenge. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. I just want to thank all of our RTD presenters. You've given us a lot to think about. Um, you've already answered a uh, question that I have. So one more brief question. Could one of you explain to me what uh, run board means? I've been trying to figure it out from context on your figures, and I'm stumped. <laughs> Excellent question. Thank you. We have, we say, a run board. It is the time period of when a service change goes into effect until it ends. We have three run boards a year. We make a service change in January. It ends in May. And we have a run board that starts the next day, ends in August or early September, and then another one that then continues again until January. So it's a period of when the service change is in effect. Yeah, and I just want to reiterate, uh, Council Member, or Board Member McInerney, and thank you for giving us all this information. A lot, lot of stuff to look over. Thank you. Phil, do you have anything you have, or can we wrap up? <coughs> Excuse me. Do we want to wrap up, or is there anything else you need to add? Nothing more about RTD, but I did just want to let you know that this is Stacy's last meeting with us, so um, her last TAB meeting with us, so um, appreciate all her work and help over the years she's been with us. So thank you, Stacy, and uh, we'll miss you. And Council Member Yarbrough, do you have any comments you'd like to make? All right. Um, I guess we can wrap this up. Can I, <coughs> excuse me, get a motion to end the meeting? Okay. We'll do comments from the board. Uh, well, RTD is still there. I'll say thank you. Um, <laughs> Um, but uh, do expect an email from me. Uh, I'm, I'm more curious about budgeting and uh, what Longmont contributes and what taxes we contribute and, and what the outcome is. So, yeah. And I would just suggest if you could send that through Stacy or me, yeah. then we can send it to you, them, you, get you, the answers, yeah. and send them all back to all it, the team members. To the right person. Yeah. We'll just make sure everybody gets the information. Yeah, yeah. So that'll be good. Well, likewise. Thank you, RTD, and thanks for your patience and, uh, in answering all the questions that we had, and um, to all the other board members for their excellent questions as well. And once again, Chair Lehner, thank you for that article you sent out um, in between meetings. And Stacy, thank you for your excellent help all the time. Um, we already thanked him, so I'm good. Um, any motion to end the meeting? Joe, do you want to find out if your council member has any comments? Oh, she said this. I move to adjourn the meeting. All those in favor, say aye. Aye. Meeting adjourned.